So welcome everyone to today's seminars. Today we have Dr. Erica Marin Spiota um, presenting Out of Sight, Out of Mind, Below Ground Response to Environmental Change and Cultural Transformations in the Geosciences. She is a professor of geography and an affiliate of the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies in the Departments of Soil Science and Forest and Wildlife Ecology in the Latin American, Caribbean and Iberian Studies Program at UW-Madison. Her lab studies biogeochemical and ecological effects of landscapes disturbance and shifts in biodiversity through the changes in land use and climate with a focus on terrestrial carbon cycling. She has served as a several leadership positions in the American Geophysical Union, including Secretary of Biogeosciences section and member of the Ethics Task Force in the Meetings Committee. The meetings committee. Currently, she is leading the NSF Advanced Partnership Award to develop bystander intervention and ethics training to improve workplace climate in the geosciences, and is also part of the interdisciplinary team applying humanities education for anti-racism literacy funded by the Whitmelon Foundation. So we are really happy to have you today and um, enjoy. Great, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm excited to be here today and share some of our work with you. Awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, land acknowledgement. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection. The University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called the Jope since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both the federal and state government repeatedly but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. We commit to acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from this on all territories. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. And feel free to use the chat to add um, an acknowledgement to where you're joining us from um, today. So I'll start with acknowledging, um, you know, I've, I've had the incredible fortune of working with an awesome group of students uh, across the years um, who have been true collaborators in uh, some of the research that I'm going to be mentioning today. And my talk has three parts. I'm going to tell you three short stories. The first one is looking at regional predictors of soil carbon. And for that, we're going to focus on the Caribbean. Then I'll talk about disturbance of deep soil carbon, and for that we'll go to the U.S. Central Great Plains. And then I'll talk a little bit about the um, Catalyze and Cultural Change through our Advanced Geopartnership Award. So a lot of the research that I'm interested in is um, really trying to understand below ground carbon cycle response to environmental change. The world's soils contain one of the largest terrestrial carbon reservoirs and play a major role in the exchange of greenhouse gases with the atmosphere, in sustaining primary production, and in providing food security. Despite this, the sensitivity of soils to environmental change, such as land use change and climate change, is highly uncertain. And one of the reasons for this is geographic variability in the different factors um, that control how much carbon accumulates or is lost from soils. And then also kind of biases in where we've historically been studying uh, our soils. Most of our understanding of factors influencing soil carbon dynamics comes from research in temperate soils and shallow soil depths. Despite the role of tropical soils in the global carbon cycle and the presence of potentially biologically active carbon in deep soil. So one of the challenges in trying to understand the response of soil carbon to environmental change um, is, you know, A, we actually um, don't really have a good grasp on how much carbon is in deep soils and soils under different environments. Um, there's still a lot of unknowns on the different factors um, controlling carbon cycling and how they respond to different environmental uh, processes. And then also really trying to evaluate the potential response rate of different soil carbon pools to changing environmental conditions. So a lot of the work I'm interested in is looking at land use and land cover change. Um, and this is some research uh, from some colleagues um, at the University of Minnesota, looking at the effects of land use change on tropical soil carbon. And you can see here um, that there's a lot of variability in the data. So some land use transitions will show an increase in soil carbon, others to show decreases in soil carbon, others have huge error bars 
right, that kind of cross um, the zero change and, you know, um, re really kind of highlights that there's a lot of uncertainty when trying to predict how different landscapes might respond um, to changes in land use. And a problem, um, especially in the tropics, is that uh, we have very much understudied different, um, different environments in the tropics. So we have a very strong geographic bias in where we focused our research. The figure on the top from this uh, meta-analysis by Jennifer Powers et al. shows the classification of land area within the tropical latitudes under different rainfall classes and also um, classified under three very broad general categories of soil. And then the bottom figure shows you where our data is coming from. This is the field studies on land use change effects on soil carbon in the tropics. And the first thing you can notice is that there's a mismatch, right, between what's, <laughs> what's represented in the tropics and where we're studying. And so we're over-representing wet areas to the, the um, you know, to, to the loss of studying dry areas. And then we're over-representing um, particular soil environments um, as well. And so one of the, um, and, and I'll, I'll mention that I've contributed to this geographic bias with my PhD and my postdoctoral research as well, oversampling these highly weathered um, soils. You can see um, an oxisol in the standing, I'm standing next to in this picture in the higher rainfall classes. And then my postdoc was in the really high rainfall class, that really dark box, the allophanic soils, which, can, which you can see almost is, is very much, um, you know, makes a really small uh, percentage of what's out there in tropical environments. So to try to fill in some of these gaps in our understanding of tropical soil carbon response to land use change, um, I collaborated with the Natural Resources uh, Conservation Service in Puerto Rico as part of the rapid carbon assessment to try to kind of fill in some of these geographic holes in our understanding. Um, and one of the advantages of working in Puerto Rico is that we actually, because of differences in geology and climate, have an incredible diversity of environments where we actually find 10 out of the 12 USDA soil orders represented um, on the island. And so it's a really nice place to start looking at kind of diversity of soil environments um, and how that affects anything from biodiversity to biogeochemical cycling. So for this particular project, uh, we were interested in um, uh, trying to identify the best predictors of soil carbon at the regional scale. And so we sampled 36 sites um, across Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands um, on seven soil orders and four uh, main land cover types. And our first hypothesis was given the diversity of, of climate and regimes that we actually find in this region was that you know, like we expect globally, climate would be a really important predictor. And actually that is not at all what, what we saw. Climate alone um, had very poorly or, or none of, you know, did not at all predict soil carbon stocks, even across, you know, large rainfall gradient from about 765 to over 4,000 millimeters of year of, of uh, uh, rainfall um, a year. And there's also no relationship with temperature um, either. We thought land cover would surely uh, be an important factor. Um, a lot of our models include climate and vegetation type as predictors of carbon cycling. And we also found um, that on the, the land covers that we've, we had represented a, a, across a number of different uh, soil orders, we found no effect of um, no difference between land covers, no difference between forests and pastures. Um, and a stronger effect of soil order. So starting to think about, you know, what, what is some of the diversity of um, the parent material, right, of climate and land cover are not that important. One of the other um, important factors that a lot of our biogeochemical and climate models include to try to predict carbon dynamics in soils is texture. And we actually found um, that percent clay had, you know, no, um, predictive, you know, no relationship with uh, carbon content in these soils. And if we added silt and clay, we started to explain some of the variability, but it was only 12% of the variability in soil carbon. So texture also not being an important predictor um, across this, this region. Silt and clay um, content also did not explain variability in radiocarbon age or, or turnover time or transit time of, um, of our organic 
carbon pools in these soils either. And you can see um, a really wide range of variability in radiocarbon concentrations of these samples um, across these soil orders um, as well. What we did find is that the concentration of um, iron and aluminum fractions um, under different chemical extractions uh, were significant predictors of how much carbon was in the soil, as well as the radiocarbon-based mean transit time. And these are, um, you know, th this particular fraction gives us a, a bit of an idea. It's targeting iron and aluminum that's associated with organometal complexes uh, in the soil. And these um, fractions that give us a little bit more information about the, the type of soil um, minerals and, and kind of soil uh, properties that we see in the environment are typically not included in our uh, models. So our studies um, or our findings in Puerto Rico across this incredible diversity of um, environmental conditions actually match some analyses of uh, you know, kind of a global analysis of soil data um, that we conducted as part of a US Geological Survey Powell Center Soil Carbon Stabilization Working Group. And this figure in particular is showing uh, Spearman, um, sorry, Spearman rank correlations um, for different soil orders, the different columns are different soil orders, and the rows are um, different predictors of carbon content. Um, and the gray colors represent a weak relationship, and the darker blue colors represent a stronger negative relationship, and the darker red colors represent a stronger positive relationship between these factors um, and soil carbon. And what I want to highlight is if we look at clay and silt and clay, the first two rows, um, these again are some of the, the factors that are most well represented in our biogeochemical models. Um, you know, a lot of across a lot of different soil orders were in the gray area, really not important predictors. And similarly to what we found, um, some other soil chemical properties such as exchangeable calcium, different fractions of um, iron and aluminum, are more, uh, more important predictors, um, you know, have stronger relationships with soil carbon. So at the regional scale, we found that even though we had a really wide range of uh, rainfall regimes from about, you know, 700 to over 4,000, we found that soil properties were much better predictors of both carbon content as well as uh, potential carbon cycling rates by looking at the radiocarbon age, then climate or land cover. And we found that the parent material diversity can override these climatic differences and suggesting that incorporating soil chemical and mineral properties information into models could inform some of the variability in carbon response that we're seeing um, you know, with, with different environmental change factors, specifically land use and land cover uh, change. So for the next uh, part of this, I want to take you to the US Central Great Plains to think about, um, you know, we're also working at a regional scale, but actually going to be focusing on deep soil carbon and the response of deep soil carbon to environmental change. So in this particular study, we've been focusing on landscape controls on carbon storage and carbon cycling and thinking about improving quantification of how much carbon is in deep soils and assessing its vulnerability to disturbance. And so we've been doing this research in Nebraska um, around where the, the red dot is. And this has been a really fun interdisciplinary collaboration uh, with geomorphologists, biogeochemists, um, and um, you know, kind of great international team of, uh, of collaborators. And so there's been a lot of recent attention in the soil carbon literature on trying to quantify how much carbon could be stored in deep soils and also think about the mechanisms that could lead to the accumulation of carbon in deep soil horizons. And so there's been a lot of attention focused on uh, root inputs and recognizing that the deeper we dig, the deeper we look, the more carbon we find and the more biologically active carbon we find in deep soil horizons. There's been a lot of work looking at uh, bioturbation, so the role of invertebrate um, and vertebrate um, organisms in moving carbon from um, you know, surface horizons and burying it deep. 
And um, some of the work that I did um, for my postdoctoral research was focusing on the vertical transport in preferential um, pathways of um, you know, relatively young, uh, fresh particulate organic matter, um, in this case, from surface horizons down to deeper mineral horizons where it could become stabilized for long periods of time. And the, um, you know, in, in the northern hemis in the northern latitudes, um, with you know recent attention or growing attention on focused on permafrost um, as a huge carbon sink and potentially a very vulnerable sink, um, you know, carbon reservoir to changes in climate. There's been a lot of work uh, looking at cryoturbation or um, you know kind of freezing and thawing processes and burying carbon. Um, you know, into deeper uh, horizons. If we, you know, one of the things, um, you know, this particular project I, I really enjoy because being in a geography department, I actually have a background in, in biology and did a lot of work on soil science, but I've been in a geography department for about a little over 10 years now, um, has really kind of broadened my perspective in thinking about landscape history, landscape disturbance, and trying to understand what are, what are some of the factors that could be influencing biogeochemistry. And so, you know, taking this geographic perspective, um, you know, have been thinking a lot about how depositional events um, could lead to the burial of carbon in deep soil horizon. So, um, um, kind of understudied mechanism from the soil biogeochemistry perspective, definitely not from the geomorphology perspective um, in how you could have accumulation of carbon either um, eroded and transported to, to that site, deposited at that site, or potentially carbon that was produced in situ um, and then buried as that landscape surface became, uh, became buried. So the presence of buried soils in the landscape can challenge our predictions of how much carbon is in that profile. Usually our models um, use exponential decay um, curves um, you know, to kind of estimate how much carbon is decreasing with soil depth. Um, but you know, if we have a buried soil, then all of a sudden, somewhere deeper in the horizon, we're hitting what used to be um, a surface soil. And, and depending on the the kind of conditions since at burial and since burial, we could actually have preservation of very large amounts of carbon in these buried soils. And buried soils occur in a variety of environments, a variety of depositional environments um, across biomes. Um, and so, you know, our, you know, our, you know, consider, or, you know, most, most of our, most of our models, most of our kind of biogeochemical models, you know, ignore the presence of, of buried soils. And so we're, we're completely um, kind of underestimating how much carbon could be in these depositional landscapes, as well as what the vulnerability um, of these uh, carbon pools might be if these, those landscapes suddenly become disturbed or um, exposed. So we focused um, our work on this particular uh, paleosol or buried soil um, in Luss Muntled Uplands in the US Central Great Plains where my um, geomorphologist um, colleague had been doing research for a long period of time. And this particular Brady soil is actually very well characterized in the literature. And this map shows you um, that it's actually found over a pretty wide geographic um, range. So all the white dots are places where this particular Brady soil, um, you know, same chemical properties, same radiocarbon age, same physical properties has been identified. So the processes that led to the burial of this Brady soil are really kind of representative of landscape disturbance over a really large geographic scale. And this black site, uh, this black dot represents um, our particular uh, site. So we quantified how much carbon could be, um, you know, preserved in this um, in this buried soil, and came up with a kind of um, you know upper end estimate, assuming, you know, if, if you assume that it's a, a continuous layer across this um, across this region, it could store up to 2.7 petagrams of organic carbon, and then we actually um, using some organic matter chemistry. 
um, identified um, a lot of this organic carbon was actually potentially pyrogenic or fire derived. So, you know, very large regional carbon reservoir. So we applied some of the um, same techniques that we usually apply to our modern soil organic matter dynamics to look at the response of um, soil carbon to modern landscape disturbance to this paleosol and using solid state carbon um, 13 nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, we actually identify this fire derived um, origin for a large proportion of the organic matter in the soil. And so I'm showing you some um, C13 NMR spectra here. Um, if you've never seen these spectra before, um, you know, only thing I wanna draw your attention to is this area highlighted um, by the red. Well, first of all, you can see the spectra look very different for the modern soil and Brady soil. And then if we focus on the Brady soil, there's a huge peak um, in, this, in this red region, right around 130 ppm, which is um, characteristic of aromatic carbon. Um, and this spectra looks just like what you'd expect from, from fire-derived um, organic matter. So this actually um, kind of brought in um, a different understanding of what the potential history was for this landscape and some of the processes that could, let, could have led to the burial um, of this carbon um, in, this, in this particular uh, landscape. We've done a lot of work characterizing um, other organic matter properties of the um, Brady soil, the paleosol, and the modern surface soil. And here I'm just showing you kind of, you know, visually, um, you can see differences among different um, you know, kind of uh, organic matter fractions isolated um, from the different soil horizons. So at the top, we've got our free particular organic matter, large occluded particular organic matter, small occluded particular organic matter. So this is released after the disruption of soil aggregates, sand, silt, and clay. Um, and you can see that in the Brady soil, you know, we've got this, this pyrogenic carbon is really, um, you know, kind of um, enriched in the aggregates. Uh, protected carbon pools. We um, conducted a whole suite of, of analyses um, looking at the organic matter chemistry of the Brady soil and found that it actually um, was a mix of what you would expect to see in a modern upper um, you know, A horizon and in a modern uh, B horizon. So you have a mix of things that, that you know, still looked like um, you know, we, we had a preservation of plant lipids, which you would not at all expect to have in really deep uh, mineral soils where you would expect to see much, you know, much more organic matter transformation and, accum and accumulation of microbial versus plant derived. So this chemistry um, suggested that, you know, the Brady soil was a mixture of uh, decomposed and undecomposed organic matter. Um, and so, you know, even though the, the carbon here was you know, about, you know, 13,000 years old, that it actually still contained compounds that could potentially be easily decomposed if it was exposed to the surface. And so most of the work we had done was focusing um, on this particular uh, position on the landscape in this particular field site where the Brady soil is located six meters below the surface. And so you might argue, well, six meters below the surface, you know, it doesn't matter, right, if we're kind of ignoring it in our models because we wouldn't expect it to be actively cycling um, with the atmosphere. And the challenge is though, that in this particular landscape, we actually have the Brady soil occurring at a variety of depths from the modern surface. And so um, we've had, you know, historically differences, amount, differences in the amount of lust deposition that buried the Brady soil in the first place. And then we've also had differences in the rates of erosion of the overlying LUS. So in many parts of the landscape, the Brady soil with its you know, 13,000 year old carbon is within half a meter or 20 centimeters from the modern surface and essentially is part of the modern soil profile um, already. And so more recently, we've been sampling along both burial transects, so places where the buried soil, the paleosol was buried at different depths, and erosional transects um, and characterizing differences in carbon content, organic matter composition, um, 
and you know seeing if you know what the potential for this ancient carbon uh, to be decomposed as it gets exposed to modern um, atmospheric conditions. And so in this in this uh, picture, you can really kind of you know right under the truck, you can discern that dark band, um, and then you can see that as we move down the hill slope, you know some of that that paleosol is already exposed at the surface. So we've done a number of um, soil incubations to see if we could reactivate decomposition of this ancient uh, carbon. Um, this particular incubation was inoculating the paleosol with uh, modern soil microbial communities, basically just a, a very dilute extract from the modern um, surface, surface A horizons. And um, so we've got in the light green on the top, we've got, we're looking at the radiocarbon concentrations of carbon dioxide uh, being respired by, um, by these soil incubations. And the dark green bars um, are from the Brady soil. So we're comparing the modern to the Brady. And we've got um, the Brady collected at different depths from the modern surface, you know, four to five meters below the surface um, up to, you know, between 15 and 30 centimeters from the modern landscape surface. And you can see that the radiocarbon values of respired carbon dioxide, right, change as we get closer to the surface. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're always more negative. They're always older than the modern surface. So we're getting some of that old carbon being respired, um, but we're seeing transformations of the organic matter as the Brady soil is exposed. And some of this is gonna be because of losses of ancient carbon, um, as well as incorporation of modern, uh, of modern carbon. So thinking about um, you know, the presence of buried soils on landscape can help us better quantify how much carbon can be in particular regions, as well as um, what the um, you know, potential vul vulnerability of uh, these large reservoirs of carbon could be to changes in, in climate or land use and land cover change. Um, and also, you know, buried soils have been studied historically in the geomorphology literature to help us understand past environmental change and past climate change. Um, and they can also be really useful in that context to help us understand how landscapes and carbon um, pools can respond to future change um, as well. And so the figure on the left here shows reconstructed uh, dune activity for the early Holocene in this particular region. Um, and you can see, you know, our, our site is just south of the Nebraska sand hills. Um, and on the right is a satellite image of, you know, not that long ago where you, you see right over the same region, huge dust storms, right? And so thinking about, you know, we, we think of erosion usually exposing carbon um, to the surface, and that's definitely happening in this landscape. But it would be interesting to think also about how you know potential increases in aridity, right? Um, greater um, intensity and frequency of drought events um, could actually lead to burial of um, some of the modern landscape uh, as well. And the the Brady soil can um, give us an idea of of what we might expect in this particular um, region. So um, for this second part, um, you know we've we've learned that geomorphology and landscape history can influence spatial patterns in carbon accumulation. Um, increasing exposure to modern surface transforms ancient organic matter in paleosols, and soil burial processes can improve predictions of regional carbon reservoirs, not only how much carbon is there, but also its potential um, sensitivity to environmental change. And then finally, I want to um, talk a little bit about this uh, more recent project that I've been involved with, um, the Advanced Geo Partnership. And a lot of this work stems through my most recent leadership um, with the Earth Science Women's Network um, that recently won two national awards in recognition for our work with, you know, with mentoring and professional development of women in the earth and space um, sciences. And so our um, Advanced Geo Partnership is funded by um, a four-year National Science Foundation Advance Award. It's um, a multi-institutional collaborative project. And we're focusing on transforming workplace climate in the geosciences. The geosciences is one of the least diverse fields in STEM, both in terms of gender, but also race and ethnicity. 
Um, and so we're developing bystander intervention and workplace climate training that centers intersectionality um, and discipline specific scenarios. So we do a lot of work um, really highlighting the disproportionate impact of um, exclusionary behaviors on people with identities that are uh, marginalized and, and continue to be underserved in our disciplines. And then we do a lot of work focusing specifically on field research and training uh, environments. We're collecting data on uh, workplace climate experiences um, in partnership with a number of uh, geoscience and ecological science societies, developing curricula that identify harassment, bullying, and discrimination as research misconduct, and ultimately developing a sustainable transdisciplinary model in partnership with professional uh, societies. So we've got a number of our organizations across the country working on this project. Our main partners are um, the American Geophysical Union, Soil Science Society of America, Geological Society of America, actually Ecological Society of America as well, um, Earth Science Women's Network and Association for Women Geoscientists. And so we're um, really kind of, uh, you know, using this national network of partners to catalyze uh, behavioral change, policy change at all levels. And so a lot of the work we've been doing with the bystander intervention is focusing on the individual. Um, we, our workplace climate training focuses on departments and then our work promoting um, the development of codes of conduct, um, you know, is at the level of professional societies and institutions, but also departments and in, in thinking about you know, field stations and field research programs. And then also have done some work as well, um, thinking about you know, policy changes um, with funding agencies um, as well. And I'll finish off with um, a little shout out to our website where we've collected, um, I think a very useful um, kind of resources for the community where you'll find research on harassment, bullying, and discrimination. Um, you know, how do you respond to these hostile behaviors? What are some strategies for creating inclusive climates? Um, you know, we've actually summarized a lot of social science research for scientists. Um, we also have an excellent page on um, resources for thinking about inclusivity, accessibility, and safety in field research and training environments, um, and have sample codes of conduct um, as well. And with that, I'll thank you for your time and open it up for any questions. Thank you for that presentation. So if you um, have any questions, you can put them in the chat or if you feel comfortable enough to unmute, that also works. Yeah, and I, I see now I had some messages in the chat about my screen share and I couldn't see my, I wasn't sharing, so I couldn't see the chat. So, oh, yeah, well. <laughs> hey, Erica, this is Marshall. Hi, Marshall. I, good to see you again. Um, very fascinating talk. Thanks for that. I'm, I'm glad uh, you were able to present to our department. So I've never worked with paleosols before, and that was one of your three stories that really kind of interested me. And I, I could ask questions all day about it. I, I just want to ask a couple. Mm -hmm. um, the incubation you showed looked really neat where it, it looked like the more that paleosol was exposed to the surface, the less older carbon there was, I think. That's mm -hmm. how I interpreted your data. Um, do you think that you know that the the pictures you show it looks like that there's a space of a, the exposed paleosol but if you go back under the soil are there roots tapping into maybe the nitrogen that's being mineralized too from those soils that are um, kind of closer to the surface that plant roots can reach yeah that's a really good question and and when we collected our samples i know i, I showed that picture from the road cut because it's so you can see it but that um, that, that's already obviously been exposed for you know some sometimes we know how old that road cut is so so yeah our sampling was definitely was kind of done further back from those road cuts and um we haven't done a great job of quantifying kind of root biomass there's not a whole ton of root in these really deep soils um that's not to say there aren't any roots and um so one of the things where we actually just submitted a proposal 
to expand the work that we've been doing at the site um, ac across a rainfall gradient and really looking at what happens to the paleosol as, it, as it's exposed to surface conditions under different rainfall regimes where you would have different vegetations with different rooting depths um, and really think, you know, trying to get at um, how, you know, how, yeah, absolutely the idea that this, you know, like deep roots kind of going in, you know, there, there's, these are really dry soils naturally, especially like our, our site is on the drier end of the rainfall. And so if, even if you bring the modern soils into the lab and you try to do, you know, measure microbial respiration, you won't get anything unless you add water to them. Um, and they, they respire more if you add nitrogen. So, so you, you got at it that they're also limited by, by nitrogen. So that's something we're, we're trying to quantify is, um, you know, what is the role of, of root inputs? Um, and we've actually done some incubations where we added um, root, ex like a cocktail of, of what potentially could be root exudates um, and also done a more long-term decomposition of actual root litter in these soils. And we do find kind of priming effects of, um, you know, of, of microbial activity. Um, but in the field, we haven't been able to really quantify that. And so it is definitely likely that even at six meters, we're probably already seeing some, some deep roots in there, um, you know, kind of, you know, tapping into, into that, that soil, um, you know, that has differences in textures, probably, you know, has more nitrogen, it probably has more, more soil moisture as well than kind of the, the, you know, the underlying and overlying less sediment as well. But uh, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this is uh, Michael Thompson, and I, I really appreciated your talk. I am interested in both. Well, I'm interested in all three topics. The first two stories, uh, particularly, I guess, uh, because they overlap some with, with my own work. And I, so I have a question about paleosols, and I also have a question about Puerto Rico. Um, one of the questions about the, well, actually two questions about the paleosols. The first one is, um, what fraction of the Brady organic matter did you find uh, was composed of that, um, that palm, the particulate organic matter? Mm -hmm. Very small. Yeah. As you could imagine, actually, we we had to we had to fractionate a lot of soil to get enough to be able to do any analysis. So there's there's very little particular organic matter left in that soil. But but that's where you found the pyrogenic carbon concentrated. Well, we actually found the pyrogenic carbon concentrated. Okay, so the free palm, which is outside of the aggregates, is really really small uh, concentrations. We found the pyrogenic carbon. Um, concentrated inside the aggregates. So in the particular organic matter released after the disruption of aggregates and specifically in kind of, you know, the smaller, the smaller size of that. Yeah. Yeah. And did you happen to do any um, uh, Delta C13 work to, to make a prediction of, of a reconstruction of the vegetation in, in that paleosome? Yeah, um, our, um, we measured that too, but actually there's there's really good records of um, kind of the, the stable carbon isotopic composition of the whole profile from the um, kind of paleo climate and geomorphology literature for those particular field sites. And so at the time that the paleo, that the Brady soil was forming, kind of at the transition from the late um, Pleistocene, early Holocene, um, that particular area, um, you know, climate, well, all the climate indicators and the geomorphology uh, supports this um, area was getting warmer and wetter and that stabilized the dunes, which allowed pedogenesis and the Brady soil to form uh, was dominated uh, first by C3 vegetation. And then over time, as it got, it got warmer and drier. Um, and this is where we think the fire came in. We actually see within the paleosol as we get closer to the top of it, we see a transition to C4 grasses. And so that, you know, that also kind of, you know, um, matches uh, potential fire history for that site. And 
And uh, the modern site at this particular location um, is a mix of C3 and C4. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, one, one question about uh, the soils in Puerto Rico. Uh, it, it, I, you noted that you didn't find a correlation between the organic matter and clay content in, in many soils. Now, this is my bias <laughs> vision of, uh, of soils in tropical regions, but I, I have this, I imagine that a lot of the clay minerals and, and those octosols and ultasols anyway, were dominated, were mainly kaolinite, but at a low activity clay. Did you, did you characterize the amount of um, gibbsite or hematite in the clay fraction of those soils? I can imagine the clay fraction being 90% kaolin height, so it wouldn't correlate with organic matter, but the active fraction, the gibbsite, the hematite, is still going to be in the clay fraction, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And we actually found, um, so we, sam we sampled across seven soil orders. Um, it definitely includes oxisols and ultisols, but we also had molosols and inceptosols and entosols and alphasols and some histosols. And um, yeah, across the entire data set, we didn't find a relationship between, between clay and, and, uh, and uh, carbon, which I agree we wouldn't expect necessarily to see in, in our kaolinite dominated soils. We did not look at um, kind of the, the type of, of clay minerals that we have in this soil. That would be kind of the next step. So we've been doing iron and aluminum extractions and some of that lab work got interrupted by events this year. And so we're hoping to hoping to finalize that across the across the soil orders. Um, but that's definitely something that I'm I'm interested in pursuing more. Is so like, okay, well, we need to dig into we need to dig into what these soils are actually made out of, right? And kind of get more into the, the mineralogy and the pedology of these soils. And and at some of the sites actually um, you know, some of some of the work that my student who recently graduated was doing this work at and, and we're expanding, we actually have a catena. Um, so we have actually uh, molosols, alphasols, and ultasols on the same landscape, basically um, all from um, karst parent material and just a different weathering stages. And so that's somewhere we've where we've become really interested in looking at, okay, it's the same climate, it's the same land use history, right? You know, let's get at let's get at, you know, the really these pedogenic controls on carbon, right? Let's go back to some of that that really, you know, kind of, you know, that basic knowledge of like how soils change over time and how that affects carbon dynamics and biogeochemical cycling, which our biogeochemical models right don't include that information right um so so yeah great question thank you thanks mm -hmm. Hey, Erica, can I jump in and ask a yeah. question? Long time no see. It's to see great it. to see you. I wanted to um, comment and ask about your third subject matter. I, um, I just really admire what you're doing and, um, you know, trying to use your position to improve the culture for your peers and for those coming up behind you. And, um, I'm really happy that I, I've started position in Ames with ARS. And um, I was a long suffering postdoc. <laughs> and I, you know, I am, um, I, I feel like I don't want the next generation to go through what I went through. And um, I, I want to know the right way to broach a conversation about toxicity in academic culture, um, which I've experienced, I've experienced bullying. My husband has too, it's not just women. A lot of it has come from women. And, but I'm not a person of color. I haven't been assaulted. A lot of these um, real problems that there are in academia, my, what I've experienced doesn't rise to that level, but 
it's still something that I think needs to be addressed. And I guess I want your input on um, the right way to talk about these lower level issues without taking away from the more severe situations that some people are encountering. Yeah, great. Well, thanks for that question, Claire. Um, and congratulations on your on your new position. That's really exciting. Thank you. So, yeah, so that's a really good question. And so we wrote the proposal at first to focus on sexual harassment because that's something that the American Geophysical Union at the time was trying to figure out, like, what do we do as a society before the next a big scandal in the news is uh, one of our members and someone that we might have um, given a, a mentoring award to, like happened to a sister society. So how can we get ahead of this um, and how can we tackle this problem? And very quickly we realized that, um, you know, sexual harassment doesn't happen in, in a vacuum. Um, you know, there's, you know, women of color experience sexual harassment and racial harassment. It's actually really difficult to separate them both. Um, and then also that environments that tolerate sexual harassment and tolerate, tolerate bullying, tolerate gender harassment, tolerate a whole suite of exclusionary behaviors. And so we actually ex really quickly expanded the scope of our work to hostile workplace climates. Um, and also realized that, you know, there's been, you know, as, as much as it feels like there has been very little progress made on tackling the problem of sexual harassment in STEM, there's been a lot more progress in that area than all the other exclusionary behaviors. And I'm glad you mentioned your partner also experiencing bullying because absolutely, you know, I think like some data suggests that 90% of, of American workers are gonna experience bullying in their workplace. And, you know, some groups experience it more, but everybody experiences. And, and honestly, like men experience sexual harassment as well. Some of the graduate student data from our university shows that, you know, we have 60% of women graduate students experience sexual harassment, but 40% of men do too. Um, so, so very important to think more broadly about all these behaviors and how they contribute to creating environments that feel exclusionary and hostile to people. Um, and also, you know, I mean, sexual harassment is illegal, right? It still happens, but it's illegal. Like a lot of these other behaviors are not even technically illegal. So, um, and they can be equally damaging. I don't, I don't like to kind of rate these behaviors in terms of like, you know, one is worse than the other because they're all, they all have really negative impacts on, you know, individuals, the community or society as well. Um, so, so that's why we've been focusing on hostile workplace climates. And we've been focusing a lot on kind of the, you know, what individuals can do to change the culture. And a lot of that, you know, a lot of our work is focused on at the faculty level, right? because um, academia is very hierarchical, right? And, you know, we are in positions, I mean, I'm a full professor, so I'm, you know, I'm at, at the place where I should be able to, to use my position to change the culture and really like hold our peers accountable and, you know, have conversations where it's not acceptable, right? Bullying is not acceptable. We need to think about how do we mentor people well, right? Um, how do we value um, people. And, you know, we, we like to say, you know, we need to treat our people better than our data. Um, and so a lot of our codes of conduct um, are really focused on thinking about, you know, all of these behavior, this, these suite of behaviors as scientific misconduct. And so, you know, I worked with American Geophysical Union on their task force to rewrite their code of conduct, which defines harassment, bullying, and discrimination as scientific misconduct. Um, and so how do we bring that to our universities, right? How do we bring that to our funding agencies um, and realize that these behaviors are why people are not staying, you know, a whole suite of people of different identities are not staying in STEM. If they're staying, they're not being as productive as they can be. Um, and we've been, they're really a problem of STEM, right? And a problem of academia and we need to, to address those. So that's kind of a, not like a very specific example, like answer to your question of how we start these conversations, but that's, you know, I'm, I'm happy to kind of follow up um, later as well. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's how we've been framing the problem. Yeah, great. And I see a, a question here too. Um, Okay, so a question about um, the first story, curious what the sample size and study area size for the regression analyses were, 
Can those relationships be extended for other study areas with similar predictors to predict soil organic carbon? Um, great. Um, so the, the regressions I showed for the, the study in Puerto Rico included data from the 37 field studies that incorporated kind of a diversity of climatic environments and in soil environments in four different land cover types across Puerto Rico and the Virgin um, and the Virgin Islands. And I can't remember exactly now, I think for some of those broader um, relationships, we might have added, um, I think for like the one with the, the silt and clay, we actually included the data from all the different um, horizons that we sampled and looked at relationships by horizon as well. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, you know, there are definitely places and environments where clay is, is a really strong predictor of soil carbon, right? Um, I think, you know, one of the, one of the challenges when kind of uh, scaling across a diversity of different types of environments is that you'll have other factors like we talked about, you know, mineralogy, the, you know, geologic diversity, right, being more important than just the, just the particle size. Um, and that, that uh, figure I, I, I showed from the USGS uh, working group um, actually, I think, had a couple thousand different, um, you know, probably, I don't know, 4,000 or 5,000 data points, um, you know, from from global data sets um, that also showed these similar patterns, right? That are again, across this, this diversity of global environments, but even within soil orders, um, finding that, you know, some other properties that, you know, soil scientists historically have known are really important and we know they are, but they're just, you know, they're not, they're not included in most of our models, right? And when we're trying to predict um, carbon cycling. So I don't know if that exactly answers your, your question. Okay. It is five, so if um, those individuals need to leave, that's okay. I did have one question, if that's yes. okay. If you have of, course. Time. Um, of course. I also wanted to thank Claire for sharing her story. Um, it takes a lot of bravery to like admit when stuff like that happens. So um, I just wanted to bring attention to that and to bring out that microaggressions micro are very impactful and sometimes even more impactful than direct racism um, mm -hmm. or any type of discrimination. So that also just a point there. And then my, my actual question, question um how is the department like accepting or like other faculty um like actually mitigating and doing the work um I know it's really hard and in the meetings everyone's like full for it but then it always is minish it right it always like trinkles out so I'm just curious um is that different in University of Madison or or how's that going I will say University of Wisconsin Madison is not different from any other uni other university. We have we have the same challenges that um, a lot of universities do, and and uh, a lot of the work that I've been doing in this um, in this area um, have actually has actually been off campus. Has been with with national partners, with professional societies, and you know. Um, I've started actually in the last couple of years to kind of focus more inward and thinking about like, okay, you know, I'm doing all this work nationally. Why not use that to kind of improve our local climate, right? Um, and so we started a climate committee in the department um, a couple of years ago, and I was one of the first co-chairs and, you know, and been thinking about, you know, how do I use my local power, right? And then how do I build, um, you know, my local network within campus because we're such a, probably like Iowa State, we're a huge campus and we're so decentralized, right? That it's often really hard to kind of implement policy change or, you know, e even, you know, there, there's people working on this stuff like all over campus, like how do you find them and how do you work together? So it's not just you trying to make change. Um, so I've been more recently kind of focusing on building those relationships on camp in my department and on campus um, to try to bring some of those changes home. And, and um, we're, yeah, I've actually just, you know, are, are part of a, a, a new project that just got funded by the Mellon Foundation working on, working on how do we use humanities um, you know, kind of research from the humanities and social scientists for anti-racism ed education and the sciences. And that's been really exciting because that's like a huge collaborative project, mostly of people at Wisconsin. And so I'm really excited about learning from them and then, and then, you know, forcing our university to make some changes as well. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, if anyone else needs any questions, please. 
Great. Well, thank you very much. And I apologize for the little Zoom snafu at the beginning, but I'm glad you got a chance to look at my beautiful field photos. I agree. <laughs> and I really enjoyed the, the conversation and the opportunity to, um, to chat with you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, and just a quick reminder, next week is Jason Ackerson um, from Purdue, Pedology, Pedometrics, Pedometrics, and Soil Health, leveraging novel data streams to enable soil conversations. Hope you guys have a good rest of your day. Cool. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.